PhD at MIT, which was uh, complete in 2021. And um, she basically works on the geochemistry and physical record of time and life and uh, various other processes that are preserved in the sedimentary record. And today she's gonna to be telling us about some of the first animals and uh, what she's learned about that. So go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, and thanks to all of you for being here today. Um, I'm just gonna, okay. Just a message from Liza, okay. Um, I'm really delighted that I get this opportunity to share some of my work with you. And I'm hoping that this will be the first of many interactions with the astrobiology crew here um, at the University of Washington. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. When we look at the world today, one of the most remarkable and beautiful things about our planet is the variety of complex animal organisms who make their home here. We have animals in a wide range of shapes and sizes and body plans, living in environments that stretch from the poles to the equator and from the tops of mountains down into the depths of the ocean. And as astrobiologists, you're all well prepared to appreciate just how rare something like this is, especially at the spatial scale. Um, I'm illustrating here for you the, the rarity of this complexity in space. Seven, nine, the eight, eight, blue zero, dot image um, of our Earth suspended in this inky void. Mm -hmm. Of course, oh, okay. to our knowledge, Earth is the only planet that hosts such a rich and diverse group of complex organisms. I feel that uh, my, um, my role as a Earth historian and a geologist is to remind all of you also how rare this complexity is in time. The complexity that we observe on Earth today is not a, a static and unchanging feature of the Earth system. In fact, the way the Earth is now is the way it has very rarely been. And I'm illustrating that to you here with this timeline, which takes us from Earth's formation about four and a half billion years ago through to the present day. Something that's really intriguing about our planet is that it's long been an inhabited planet. We have ample geological and geochemical evidence and fossil evidence for the presence of relatively simple single celled organisms on our planet, but complex and when, when I say complex life, I mean macroscopic multicellular organisms that have differentiated internal tissues only appear on the scene relatively recently. And they've only been around for about 10% of Earth's total history. And understanding why this is has clear implications for understanding how abundant or rare complex life might be in the universe oh, and what we might need to look for as we peer beyond our own planet for evidence of life elsewhere. Sure. Looking uh, at this. Um, seven, nine, eight, eight, zero, zero. Hi, um, Liza, I'm just seeing that the speaker slides aren't advancing to the audience. Has that been fixed? Uh, it has, um, it has not. Okay. I've pressed resume share um, and nothing is happening. On my head over. Okay. Um, let me, great, we'll see Liza soon. Um, in the meantime, I'm wondering if the Zoom camera is good enough. To... Ah, okay. Yeah, it's got just. We we can see your slides now. Okay, but I don't know that did it advance for you or did it not advance? I can see a slide with a koala and a whale and bats on it. Whereas before we yes, were seeing those, your title slide. That, and is that slide changing for you at all? Uh, no. Yeah, so it seems like I can share the first slide, but then it won't advance to later slides. Um, 
If you don't mind, I'll just pause and see if I can share this as a PDF, and then maybe that would resolve the issue. Marjorie, yeah. you could also try making it full screen and then sharing it. Okay, that's a good idea. Uh, would you mind coming down and helping me do that? I, Oh, I think if we can get all this work. I know it looks on Windows. How do I, do you know yeah, how to I mean, pull up something while it's on a Mac? Shift T. Shift T. Okay. This is terrible. <laughs> Give me a second. What if it, it there's the Zoom. Let's try. Hello, everyone. Let's try just sharing. It's this one. Yeah, let's try just sharing the whole desktop and then coming here and clicking play. Okay. Do you guys see the slide now? Yes, try advancing it. We'll see if it advances. Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, Perfect. Great. Okay. Thanks so much. Perfect. Team effort. All right. Okay. So just to reorient everybody, black line is all of our history. Green line is evidence of relatively simple life on earth. Blue line are photogenic koalas and other things uh, on this slide. Okay. So looking at this slide um, and which, yeah, we've all had time to contemplate in great detail now. Um, complex life is only present on earth for about the last 10% of earth history. Um, which is intriguing. Um, why did complex life appear when it did? The other way I like to ask this question is why did it take so long for everybody to show up? Um, many have looked at this record and, and, and suggested or hypothesized that, there, that what's present here is a record of environmental constraint. So there's something about the earth system which is preventing complex life from appearing and that constraint is lifted and complex life appears. And if that's the case, and this truly is a record of environmental change, a change in some important boundary condition of the earth life system, then understanding what that parameter was and how, when, where, and why it changed would also be really important for understanding the presence of complex life elsewhere. Finally, the environments in which animals first evolved on our planet shaped their anatomy, their physiology, their behavior in ways that are still affecting organisms alive today. And so understanding the homes of these first animals was critical to understanding the coevolution of Earth and environment and animal and organisms through time. With all of these motivating questions um, in place, um, you'll understand why my research has focused so far on this window of time here. This is the period of time when animals are first appearing on Earth in the fossil record. They're diversifying and they're spreading across Earth's ocean environments. And the periods of time that I focused on have formal names, the Ediacaran and the Cambrian periods, which together span about um, 150 million years from about 635 to 485 million years ago. When we reconstruct, uh, the text up there says an Ediacaran ecosystem. So when we reconstruct a late Ediacaran ecosystem with some of these early animals, this is the sort of uh, thing we imagine. This is a really nice watercolor reconstruction of the bottom of the Ediacaran seafloor in some sort of shallow marine environment. We see uh, animals which look pretty weird to us. Many of these were likely soft bodied, um, probably kind of like a jellyfish in texture. They lived um, 
on the ocean floor. They didn't really move around so much within their lives, um, but remained rooted in one place. Um, and I think this is, I, I love this image because it's really rich and evocative and beautiful. Um, and of course, it's also uh, entirely based on observations of rocks, right? Nobody has ever seen this, even though it's so beautifully imagined. Um, it's entirely reconstructed from lots of time and analysis started in places that look like this. Um, so this is where my work begins in the field, going to um, landscapes like this one and collecting rocks, sedimentary rocks that I describe and analyze um, in the lab and in other places. So this is one of my field sites from Oman. Oman is a country in the Middle East whose neighbors are Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Um, and we're standing here with our boots in these low um, carbonate hills, the, which is actually an ancient microbial reef. Uh, you can see some trucks down here in the, the lower right for scale. And we can see across this valley and through to these hills on the other side, Within those hills, you can see layers of sedimentary rock. So everything you see in this image is a sedimentary rock that was deposited in a shallow tropical ocean that covered this part of the world about 600 million years ago. These rocks formed in that ocean and they still carry traces of the biological and physical and chemical conditions in which they formed. One example of a biological trace preserved in these rocks is shown here. So this big mound of rock is a stromatolite. It's an accretionary layered structure made by cyanobacteria uh, as they trap and bind sediment and grow upwards from the sea floor. In other rocks, you might find the little footprints of early animals preserved or even shells and fossils related to them. So that covers us on the biology side. Sedimentary rocks also preserve really rich physical records of the world. Um, so for example, storms churn the bottom of the ocean in particular characteristic ways, um, leaving structures that we can recognize in sediments long after those storms have passed. And from that, we can reconstruct physical information about the world like waves, currents, the strength or frequency of storms um, and interpret um, make interpretations of fluid dynamics and sediment transport to reconstruct uh, things like water depth and other physical parameters. Much harder to illustrate, but still uh, really motivating and in fact really important to this talk are geochemical records preserved in this rock. Uh, geochemical records that we can um, interpret uh, to make sense of key parameters like oxygen, temperature, or water pH and even records that we can use to interpret changes in key biogeochemical cycles like the carbon cycle. My favorite type of sedimentary rock to work with are carbonates, rocks like limestone and dolomites. Um, and the reason that I love working with these rocks is because they precipitate directly from seawater. Um, and that means that they contain particularly helpful records of the chemistry of that ancient ocean in which early animals made their home. In addition to biological, physical, and chemical traces, there's another key variable hidden in these rocks, and that's time. So sedimentary rocks accumulate um, in the same way that clothes in your laundry hamper also accumulate one layer at a time. And in the spatial arrangement of those layers, there's information about their relative age. So here we're depositing layers of rock, one on top of each other. And we can say that the rocks on the bottom are older than the rocks on the top. This is a really powerful way to think about change. We can say that, we can say that, um, the biological and physical and chemical traces preserved in this lowermost layer came before the same traces preserved in the uppermost layer. That's critical to understand and apply, but it's also really limited. To take our analysis to the next level, it's really helpful to be able to put those observations into absolute time. 
to be able to nail down the records preserved in these rocks to a particular point on the timeline. If we can directly date the absolute ages of these layers, then we are able to say that the changes we observe between layers, uh, we can figure out how quickly or slowly that change happened. We can uh, make a quantitative measure that we can then directly compare to model output results and predictions. Um, and it's especially critical if we want to connect events which are recorded in different parts of the world to each other. It's only by pinning things to an absolute timeline that we're able to understand if the changes that we're observing are local or more regional, or if they're truly global in nature. So how do you do that? How do you tell absolute time in sedimentary rocks? I use radioactive isotopes. So isotopes that decay into stable daughter products at well understood uh, rates. Um, to make an interpretation of, of age. And a major focus of my research program right now is pushing, um, this, uh, pushing and testing this emerging technique to apply uh, the, these techniques to directly dating carbonate rocks. And I'm gonna take some time to walk you through what this technique looks like and what the data that we generate look like as well. So my um, favorite radioactive element uh, is uranium, which decays over time in a well understood way to isotopes of lead. There are different isotopes of uranium that decay into different isotopes of lead. Um, I won't go through all the details of that here, but what's useful for you to know is that having these two different uranium clocks allows us to cross check and cross compare the results between these two systems, adding to our confidence in the results that we get. Okay, so I'm interested in measuring uranium and I'm interested in measuring lead, but how is that actually achieved in the laboratory? So I take a sample of a sedimentary carbonate. It could be a one inch round mount of rock that's been cut and polished. It could also be a paper thin slice of a rock mounted on a thin section plate. Um, and I introduce that into a laser ablation system. Once that sample is in place, I'm able to use a laser to uh, blast a tiny pit in the sample. And this laser beam has a diameter on the order of 100 to 200 microns, giving me um, spatial pretty good spatial resolution across the sample. I'm able to measure uh, multiple locations using this laser, and I make many measurements within the same sample. As the laser ablates, it generates a plume of material that's evacuated away from the sample, ionized in a plasma, and then passed through to a mass spectrometer, which is uh, a machine capable of making very precise measurements of how much uranium and lead are present in my sample. I'm gonna walk you through what the data looks like when it's generated. Um, so all the data I show you today are gonna to be plotted in this space. On the x-axis, we have a uranium lead ratio. And on the y-axis, we have a lead isotopic ratio. When a rock first forms, like that stromatolite I showed you earlier from Oman that's growing on the sea floor. Oh, before I get to that one, I also need to tell you about this curve called Concordia which lives in the space of this diagram. Every point on Concordia corresponds to an age with younger ages lying farther to your right and older ages lying farther to your left. So when that rock first forms at uh, T equals zero, it, it will have a spatially variable distribution of uranium which leads to a lot of spread in our x-axis. But the lead isotopic composition within it will be constant, meaning that the data points I measure with the laser across the sample would define a horizontal line like the one you see here. So the rock just formed at the bottom of the ocean. Now it's going to uh, age. As it ages, some of that uranium decays into lead and that shifts the isochron this way, as the uranium decays into lead, 
changing its position in both X and Y. The line that connects all of these points is called an isochron. And we can measure the age of the sample at the intersection of the isochron with Concordia. So if we allow more time to pass and our rock to age more, the isochron will continue to rotate and begin to intersect older and older ages um, on this diagram. So this is a basic primer for how uranium lead in situ dating of carbonate works. This technique is um, in one that's still in its early days. Um, it was the first paper applying it was published less than a decade ago. But because of the rapid throughput and the simple sample preparation associated with this technique, we've seen really rapid application uh, and uptake to date carbonate minerals from a really broad range of geological settings. Everything from dating the deposition of rocks within lakes to uh, examining the alteration of oceanic crust, dating cave formations, or carbonates associated with things like faulting and earthquakes. For those of us who are interested in understanding our planet as our single case study of a planet where life appeared and diversified into the complex life forms we have today, this technique is really exciting because it has the potential to transform our understanding of Earth's history. It's often difficult to tell time in sedimentary successions, to tell absolute time, but it's critical for the reasons I outlined before. Often we don't have fossils or more traditionally used geochronometers to tell time in those rocks, but carbonates are really ubiquitous throughout Earth's sedimentary successions. So if we can date them reliably and rapidly, this could transform our understanding of Earth history. But this is a technique that has substantial analytical and geological challenges that still need to be overcome. And a lot of my work is focused on addressing these. One key geological challenge that I want to share with you today um, asks you to come back to this landscape and consider it again. I told you earlier today that this Everything you see here was deposited in a shallow tropical ocean. Um, it is clearly not there anymore, right? A lot has happened to these rocks since they were at the bottom of the ocean. They were originally deposited as silt and sand and mud. They were buried, they were lithified, they were deformed as two tectonic plates came together. They were uplifted and they were eroded. So a lot has happened. And so while we can say that sedimentary rocks start with a record of their original environment, we always need to keep in mind that these later events can overwrite this record, potentially changing, especially the geochemical records that they contain. I like to think of sedimentary rocks as starting with the signal of their original depositional environment which has to pass through a filter of later events before arriving at the record that a geologist like myself can go and measure. So if we're not careful about this, we run the risk of mistaking changes made by the filter for an original depositional signal. Being able to distinguish between original and later signals preserved in our rocks is critical. Having some way to reliably detect this overwriting and resetting would be hugely helpful. And so what I want to suggest is that by applying in tandem geochemical measurement techniques to, uh, to get at some of those proxies um, and um, my technique of going in and directly dating uh, using the uranium lead system, those phases, we can increase our confidence that we are getting to a truly reliable and robust record of ancient environments. I'm gonna share with you today a brief case study in telling time using this method. Um, and it'll lay out for you some of what's really easy about this technique, what's hard and where I think we're going next. So the sample that I'm gonna share with you today for this case study is this sample here. This is a sliver of rock um, 
from the uh, cowhead group, which is exposed in Western Newfoundland. This rock has been cut paper thin and then mounted on a petrographic thin section slide. Um, this rock dates to the Cambrian. Its age is really well constrained because of the sum of the fossils that it contains. So this rock and the succession that it comes from could tell us a lot about early environments that animals emerged and diversified in um, before, um, as they develop the ecosystems that look something like today's. That is, if it preserves an original depositional signal. When we look at this rock in greater detail, um, there are some interesting features that I'd like to point out to you. Um, if you can make out this dark shrubby texture that's present throughout the sample, this is a, a classic um, Cambro Ordovician uh, in age uh, fossil called Epiphyton. It's thought that it likely represents um, a cyanobacterial um, colony. Um, and these uh, microbial fossils are encased in cement and work by uh, other geologists at the University of Kansas to really probe the geochemistry of these cements and their petrography suggests that many of them originally precipitated from seawater in a shallow uh, marine setting. Also within this sample are these open pore spaces, uh, which were originally open within the microbial reef that this rock uh, formed in, that have since been filled in by later generations of cement. When I go in with a laser and I target some of these cement rich areas and I measure the isochrons like the ones I showed you earlier, I get ages that are consistent with the known depositional ages of this sample, which is consistent with the idea that we are recording either an original depositional signal or something that comes really shortly afterwards. And this should increase our confidence in, this, uh, in the records that this rock contains as a reliable and robust record of the environment in which early animals made their homes. We see the same thing in other locations in the sample. This cement rich domain gives an age that agrees well with deposition or an early post depositional process as does an age generated on this, uh, this region here. But the story isn't always so simple. It's clear that we can recover depositional or near depositional ages from this sample, um, indicating to us that this rock could be an exceptional record of ancient ocean chemistry, but it remains a little bit more complicated than that, especially when I go in with the laser to target these epiphyton rich zones. So these are the zones characterized by that shrubby texture. This is the age that I measure uh, on this uh, rock. And for those of you um, who aren't geologists, um, I'll highlight that this age is about 60 million years too old. It's easier to imagine how some of those processes I talked about earlier could overwrite your rock and give you an age that was too young. But getting an age that's too old is harder to explain. And it should shake our confidence in this technique a little bit. But this error is reproducible. We see another age that is too old when we look at this epiphyton rich zone in the sample. And we see it again when we look in this area. So, What's going on here? Well, I've used a range of geochemical and situ techniques to, to try and get at some of these questions. And I'm happy to discuss these in greater detail for, with other geologists who are interested. But for this, uh, this group, I'll cut to the chase. I think what we have here is some sort of geochemical heterogeneity in this sample that is affecting uh, analytically um, the ionization of uranium and lead in the sample in a way that is giving us incorrect two old ages. And the particular culprit that I think is in play uh, here is iron. So if we come back to this slide where I walked you through how these data are generated, what we think is happening is that um, as your laser ablates your sample, 
it's not just ablating the uranium and lead, it's ablating everything in your sample. Um, and those different elements can interact with each other in different ways at the, at the point in analysis where you're ionizing your samples. There's known interactions between different elements. Um, iron seems to be the, the element that varies spatially um, together with some of the unusual ages we're getting. And so we think that that's what's going on. With this, uh, this effect um, happening to our samples, uh, we're suppressing iron, we think, lowering the uranium lead ratio that we're measuring, meaning that we are pushing our data artificially along the x-axis, meaning that we're measuring an isochron that looks like this when we really should be measuring an isochron that looks like this. To further explore this possibility, let's pool all of our data together from both domains, both the accurate and inaccurate ones. So here's all of our data from uh, the two old regions characterized by abundant epiphyton fossils, showing that to you here. And here, the, all of the analyses from the domains that seem to give us reliable at seemingly accurate ages. In both of these cases, I'm showing you data from the other isochron plotted in, with, in red dotted lines, so you can appreciate the slight difference, the slight but real difference between these two arrays. It does seem that there's a systematic offset here. And so if our hypothesis is correct, that there's some analytical issue affecting our uranium lead analyses, um, then an additional correction to this factor should applied systematically should bring us into agreement. And when I apply an arbitrarily cho chosen factor, that is indeed what we see here. So this case study that I've shared with you highlights some of what I find both so tantalizing and so frustrating about this technique. I'm able to generate very sensible ages that make good geological sense and highlight the potential of this rock as an archive for ancient ocean chemistry at the time of early animal evolution. Yet it's also undeniable that this rock also yields geologically nonsensical ages. And everything that I've shown you today was measured on the same sample in the same analytical session. I think that our path forward here though, is the observation that this analytical issue seems to be petrographically or texturally controlled related to other geochemical heterogeneities that we can measure in the same sample. And so I offer this forward as a case study to highlight that integrating sedimentology and petrography and a deep understanding of where the geochemical data you're generated is being generated and how it's being generated is critical if we want to offer a reliable record. This sample is geologically and analytically quite complex. If we didn't have a robust understanding of how old the sample really was though, a conservative interpretation might be that we have an old rock that experienced a younger recrystallization rather than appreciating the analytical complexity here. If we had no other age control, uh, that might be the incorrect interpretation we took away from this rock. And so as we work towards building a, a reliable geochemical record of the past and the early, um, the environments in which early animals evolved and made their homes, it's important to remember that sedimentary rocks record more than just their initial environment, and that analyzing them isn't as easy as um, firing a laser and taking for granted the data that you get. So to wrap up today, I've reminded you all that complex life is rare in both space and time, that reconstructing the first homes of early animals can help us understand why it is rare in space and time, I've also highlighted to you some of the ways in which geological and especially sedimentological records are complex and that they integrate both primary and secondary components, which must be distinguished from each other. And that in situ carbonate um, geochronology using uranium lead dating is a tool for doing this, but one that still requires a lot of deep work and uh, careful attention to achieve its full potential. All right, that's what I've got for you today. Thanks so much for your time and attention.
Okay, questions? Um, Nick. This could be um, kind of a dumb question, but... Um, Maybe you should speak up so okay. the owl can, oh, we'll have to repeat it. Okay, so um, I was wondering about if you're getting older ages of your brain with age, then so the age of fossil brain. Um, and could it, it, is it possible, like, where does the uranium and lead initially come from? It comes from then. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So the source of the uranium um, in your sample is from seawater. Um, that yeah, originally did come from some sort of continental um, weathering source. Um, the the issue the the problematic thing about the data that I've I've shown um, like one way you might get two old ages in a rock would be if you incorporated excess lead and you weren't and your analysis wasn't sufficiently refined. To, to detect that. that would You'd have too much daughter isotope and you'd push your ages too old. Um, that doesn't seem to be what's going on with our samples. When I go in and I do in-situ characterization, looking for that excess lead, it's not there. Um, and so I think that, that what we have here, um, it also, the initial isotopic, we can discuss the sort of um, thinking about the, the analysis to Tara Wasserberg space together together later, um, but the yeah the problematic thing really does seem to be an analytical issue. Um, yeah. Yep. I have two questions. Uh, the first one: Do you think that by doing these kinds of analysis uh, analyses and looking at iron content and that sort of thing? Is there could be an automatic correction factor applied. Um, you measure the amount of iron in the sample and you go, oh, okay, it's going to take up, it's going to have too, it's going to connect with yeah. too much of this thing. And so we can account for that. Right. Yeah, that's the hope eventually, right? So this is a technique. Like I said, it's still early on. And so there's, um, there's a single standard in, y in wide use. All of the and all of the data that I showed you today was corrected using that standard, right? So it, it seems to work quite well for some areas of the sample, but it doesn't work very well for other areas of the sample. Um, and I think there's a clear need within the community to build out a larger suite of standards. Um, but these 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 types of matrix effects, where you have the interaction of of geochemical heterogeneities within the sample affecting your analysis is still not widely considered. It's often not thought about in interpreting data from these rocks. Yeah. The second question, um, you said the epi pythons were like the uh, relics of microbial mass, like cyanobacterial mass. Um, and cyanobacteria are like need iron for photosynthesis, right? That's like one yeah. of the main things. So do you think that you could also end up using that sort of Potentially iron content as a differentiation of parts of the rock that might be more biological in origin? Yeah, I think it's really intriguing. Like cyanobacteria have a quite a big iron, like metal need in general um, to, to do pigments and the stuff they use for photosynthesis. Intriguingly, um, the iron content associated with those epiphyton rich layers is actually low relative to other parts of the rock, um, uh, which yeah, I have some ideas about that we can we can talk about later. But yeah, I mean, I think that this is in my mind. I view this work as a clear call to understand um, geochemical variability within a sample and to recognize that it it occurs at fairly small scales in clear association with biology as well as other characteristics of the rock, and that can all affect your analysis. Other questions, Dom. Uh, do you ever use zircons in, in, in this work, or is that just contamination? Yeah, I do. I, I have used zircons in the past um, for yeah for a variety of things. Um, I have an interesting um, an, another interesting study that tr tries to marry detrital zircon geochronology with in situ uh, carbonate work to really understand what it what process it is actually that we're dating using the carbonates. Um, 
the thing about zircon, uh, and for those of you, those of you who don't know, um, zircon geochronology is really the gold standard when it comes to telling time in sedimentary successions because you can achieve um, incredible accuracy and precision analytically by analyzing them, and they tend to occur within volcanic ashes, which provide very clear marker beds. Um, uh, the thing about zircons in volcanic ashes is that they tend to occur in tectonically or volcanically active environments. Carbonates uh, tend to occur more in passive margin settings where you often may not have volcanic ashes around or available um, for dating. So um, my hope is that this is a, uh, a complement or a replace, you know, something we can turn to when we don't have those other geochronometers available. Hope. Outside yeah. Control, how would we be able to tell that there wasn't uranium introduced to the groundwater? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in that, so I think two parts of that question. Um, the first part is I think that there's still a lot of complexity with this technique, which is why I'm trying to work it out in these case studies where we do have additional age control, whether it's from zircon or other uh, geochronometers or fossils. It can help us really get at what process it is that we're dating. Um, the second thing is, if uranium was uh, with, was introduced, that would reset um, some aspects of uh, the, the, the system that you're measuring. And I think you would visualize that disturbance um, in, your, in the isopron that you measure. Yeah. Tom? Sorry to ask the second Please. question, but I'd yeah. like to ask about Mars. Yeah. So what is your excitement about Mars? Because we have really old samples. Uh, yeah, so there's, the yeah, there's, there's a really exciting paper uh, in review right now at Geochronology that's done this technique to carbonates within an Allen Hills meteorite, and they get an age that makes geological sense for Mars. So I think that that's exciting. I mean, I, carbonates are going to be wonderful tracers of a, a hydrothermal system. Um, so yeah, I think that it's, it's, it's already been done, which is really exciting, and I'm excited to see where it continues to develop. Yeah, I was thinking particularly about the return samples. Yeah, so yeah, it, it, it is exciting. Um, yeah, and it's in this Martian meteorite that's been analyzed. It, it seems to work. The, um, the analyses seem to make geological sense. Um, and yeah, I, I think that I would probably... Uh, given the like limited amount of sample material, it's exciting to think about laser ablation giving you spatially resolved data before you go in with higher precision techniques to really make the most of it. Well, it's just like the man. Yeah, <laughs> plus or minus some Yeah. So could you develop an instrument to do this in situ on Mars? I think you could, yeah. yeah. I have a background question. Uh, could you explain why the, it's a, Good assumption to take up the initial uh, lead isotope ratio to be constant for us. Yeah. Um, so as long as there's no fractionation of lead isotopes within formation of your carbonate, it's a good um, assumption, and it it analytically seems to be the case that this is so. Um, you're also able to use um, one another product that I didn't get into today is that you're also able to to calculate your initial lead isotopic composition at the time that the carbonate formed, which could be another tracer for processes like groundwater flow where um, your those interacting water masses might have uh, different characteristics. Yeah. Other questions? Yep. Yeah, I just have a quick question here. Um, so you talked about ion kind of interfering on this other part mm -hmm. of the dating your sample. Are there other elements that are known in maybe other fields that yeah. affect the dating? It, yeah, so um, iron certainly affects, iron and vanadium are the two that I've come across in the literature and in my conversations with other people. Um, but I think that there's still a lot of work to, to be done. Um, you can imagine doing work with like synthetic solutions designed to mimic carbonates of different compositions and being able to quantify that in a more uh, robust way. Right now it kind of is at the level of anic data. So is this only for marine carbonates? Could it be used in lakes? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. but then the source of uranium could be more variable, couldn't it? 
um, in can you tell me what you mean by well i don't know it could be surface waters ground waters and maybe that messes things up i don't know i would say that i think it works better more often in lacustrine carbonates than it does in marine carbonates okay why is that i i think that um I think it has, I'm not sure why, that's based on like a review of the, of the literature that's been published. Lacustrin carbonates are often reliable. It could be there's a lot, they're in a different diagenetic sort of state. Mm -hmm. it, it could be that um, there's some aspect of the water chemistry that's different. Um, it, yeah, um, it could be, um, I don't know. There's often an aspect I didn't get into today with my with microbes doing good work for you, and maybe that's different in a in a lake than in a marine setting. And also, for this particular sample that you highlighted in Newfoundland, why did you choose that particular one? You talked mm -hmm. about Olus um, bidella. Yeah. Maybe you could go into a bit more, expand a little bit mm -hmm. on the paleontology as to yeah. why this is a particular interest. Yeah, so I selected this sample because a great deal of previous work had been done on it to characterize the cements that were present and its diagenetic and depositional history. Um, and so my thinking um, at this stage has been to collect uh, carbonate samples from a really wide range of depositional settings, geological histories that we expect to be fairly well preserved and uh, to behave relatively well and to give us ages that are close to or approximate a depositional age. Um, so that was, that's been sort of my search mechanism. And then I, I think that by giving the uranium lead clock sort of the best opportunity to succeed in these rocks, we are able to realize errors like this one um, in, in the analysis where it, it's clear that the, petrogra the petrographic and geochemical and fluid inclusion work gives us a really rich data set that we can then compare um, the dates that we generate in this technique against. Steve? Uh, you started out your talk um, with the question, why did it take so long for mm -hmm. complex life to arise? Yeah. And do you have a hypothesis or a guess? Yeah, so um, I... I, I guess I'll give a nod to the sort of two end members. One is the one I developed more in the night talk, right? Which is that it's environmentally controlled in some way, that there's some key constraint that is then lifted. Um, and the other alternative hypothesis would be that it there's some sort of biological evolution machinery that has to get put into place before you can um, become so complex. Um, I... I tend to think that it is likely environmentally controlled. Um, I think oxygen is really important um, as I think many people who do work in this period would agree. I also think temperature is really important. Um, and I don't think it makes sense to consider oxygen and temperature separately. Um, temperature is certainly a control on how much oxygen you have uh, in, uh, in seawater where it's at. Um, I'm also really compelled by um, data which suggests that primary producers uh, in the, around this um, change switch from cyanobacteria to algae, um, which, uh, yeah, could have interesting implications for the food web you're able to build from larger primary producers. Yeah, so those are some of my, yeah, collected ideas about what might be important. And if you perfected this dating technique, where would you go? What would you measure to try and test mm -hmm. some of those hypotheses? What would be the most important mm -hmm. section? Yeah. For the, mm -hmm. I don't know, the time points that, yeah, where you can kind of constrain this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you were able to use this technique reliably, um, I think it would be really, I would love to explore the boring billion more um, and see if there's and that's not too boring not for me okay. um, um, but this it's this window of earth history where people like to say nothing has happened uh, it's you don't get much 
tectonic activity, the things seem to be really static. Um, and if that's true, then we could think about that as a case study counterpart to this window of time when everything seems to be happening. Um, are, the, are the records that we get from these two, two periods of time really so different? Is there, um, yeah, is there some change in the rate of change? Is there, is there some characteristic difference between the two periods that, that we need to think about differently? Okay, any more questions? Uh, is there anything, any people online out there? Do you have a burning question? There's nothing in the chat. Doesn't sound like it. Okay, well, let's thank uh, Marjorie once again.